Okay. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, we're going to do some housekeeping first. Um, we're going to take um, questions, uh, hopefully after the presentation, and uh, I'll repeat the questions so that everybody, including our online uh, folks, can um, can understand what we're talking about. And um, let's see. Um, moving along to, to business, we've got new T-shirts. And I don't see enough of those new T-shirts. Janice has got one, and then uh, Barb has one. <laughs> We've got our new T-shirts for sale in the office. We'll have that open after um, after the presentation, after the meeting. Yes. Um, Beers is saying we got Mars Canal on the front and DNR on the back. So please consider buying a T-shirt. Greenway stuff, all kinds of Greenway stuff going on these days. Um, the lock project in Wharton is moving along, but um, is stuck on some technicalities with the, the grantor uh, at the moment that are much too complicated. And so um, we've been working on Greenway projects with other individual locations. We have completed a uh, Greenway project at Dorsey's Pond in Montville, um, completed and installed. Uh, Plain 6 West at Port Colden, working with Warren County. Uh, those panels are now fabricated and installed. I'm not sure that the property is actually totally open to the public, but Tim will talk about that momentarily. And um, Lock Street in Newark, a whole new area for us. Uh, those panels are now designed and edited, and uh, they've gone to the proper people for approval. So they hopefully we'll be going to fabricating those projects, uh, that project pretty soon. Also, uh, Greenway projects that are still in the works, uh, Dover, we're uh, having a three panel or designing a three panel set for J JFK Park in Dover, and a single panel for Waterworks Park. So that's four pieces for Dover. Um, Plain 5 West at Port Murray, we've got a project with, with uh, uh, Warren County to to fabricate uh, panels for for that whole site. Um, Griffith Park and Booton, uh, we're still going slow with that one. Um, too many things to do, and we've recently been approached by uh, uh, Morris County. They are beginning to to complete their um, DYS and W. Uh, rail um, rail trail project from uh, Pequannock down to Mountain View. And of course, at Mountain View, it coincides with the Morris Canal Greenway. So they're looking for signage for the Greenway along that route. And so we're negotiating with them. Yes. Um, Disappearing Act, Bob Goller's book. We know we've been waiting for this for a long time. So Bob is not well, and he's doing uh, the best he can. I believe that we have got a finished copy, and our editor, Kathy Bazaar, has been working on the formatting. Now, she's promised to have that done by the end of September, uh, but this still needs approval from Bob. We need to fabricate another sample book, and hopefully then we'll go to press. So knock on a block of wood. Beers. then sit there please um maybe for christmas we're hoping knock on a block of wood mm, yes this is going to be a great book we've been waiting for it for a long time and it is uh it is absolutely great we can't wait for it to go to press and to have it for you folks to keep in your hands at a reasonable price um volunteers we're doing so many things. We're attending so many events. Our uh, our programming at, at Waterloo is going on uh, to the end of October. Um, we need more folks to be volunteering and helping out. Uh, Bobby, where are you? You need to talk to this lady. Okay. Um, okay. We don't need heroes. We don't know people. We don't need to have people there every time, but we need people to help out. It's a lot of fun. We have a good time. Uh, we're planning an end of the year volunteer, um, um, probably a luncheon. So uh, come out and join us and um, have a good time. Talk to the public and um, uh, talk to Bobby about getting on the list. Okay. Archives.
He jumped too fast from house cleaning to everything else that he did. Um, I just like to remind everybody that if you could put your phones on vibrate or something so that uh, we're not interrupted during all our programming. And when the program is over and after the questions and answers are done, we need to move out. So um, all the food will be moved into the into the office and so that we can clean up so that the cleaning crew can come in. They have we need to be out of here at least by 930 just to get everybody get your running shoes on. Right. That's it. Yes, boss. This is Janice and she is the office manager. And she is the one who makes all of this the arrangements for us to be here possible. You know the answer. It's in the design stage and it'll be there until I finish it. Thank you. Okay, archives. Um, John? John Prytow? Thank you, Joe. Good evening. Uh, quick update on archives. Uh, as of late, we finished our inventory. We found most everything. <laughs> That's in all in a safe place. So we're ready to go with that. Uh, the latest news is uh, we're going to be opening the archive, as you may have heard, for visitors to come in for research. Uh, we're looking at sometime in December. So... Keep an eye out for that and uh, stay tuned. I think we're ready. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, John. John has done an absolutely marvelous job. When we started uh, a little more than a year ago, uh, our archives were well, a disaster wouldn't be appropriate, but they had been used for years and there were very few of us who knew who could find anything. And so John has completely turned that around and the fact that we can actually invite you folks to make an appointment and come and look at the archives to do some real research uh, is an amazing feat. So thank you, John. Uh, a piece of news, um, the DNR Canal State Park is gonna have a 50th anniversary next year. So we're gonna be planning other um, uh, events uh, around uh, that uh, anniversary. Uh, those events are still in the planning stage, but to stay tuned and we're gonna need uh, you folks to help us out, help us to, to uh, participate in that. Uh, I think Bob has got some uh, announcements to make and I'm sure that uh, he'll have something additional to say about that. Uh, one last thing, uh, the Roblin chapter of the Society for Industrial Archaeology, I know some of you are crossover members, they are having a symposium uh, on October the 28th at Montclair State University. So that's about to be announced soon. And so uh, if you're interested in that, see beer here in the front row. Now, announcements. Bob, you want to make some announcements. Joe, thank you for announcing the 50th anniversary. It's the legislation that created the DNR Canal State Park and the DNR Canal Commission that's been working so hard to keep the DNR Canal as rural as possible. Uh, we're asking, the, we're working, we being the uh, DNR Canal Watch, which is a nonprofit down there on the DNR, we're working with the state park and putting together activities for the 50th anniversary. Still looking for ideas. So if you have any ideas on what you would like to see, let me know or let Linda, my wife, know. Uh, it's Barth, Linda, 123 at AOL.com, and uh, we'll pass them along to the committee that's working on the 50th anniversary. One of the things that the DNR Canal Watch did was they created, as they usually do, this wonderful calendar of all pictures that were taken by people who use the canal. And in here, Tim has a picture in here that he's taken. I have two of my pictures in here. You might want to take a look at it. I'm selling them here tonight for $20, and it's a fundraiser for our organization. Now I know Tim's going to announce this, but I'm going to I'm going to sneak in on you, and that is that the DNR Canal, or sorry, Somerset County is having their journey through the past. Morris Canal County has one now, and three of the canal buildings or associated buildings will be open. This is on the 
October 7th from 10 to 5 and October 8th from noon to 4. The East Millstone Bridge Tender Station will be open as well as the outhouse, not usable, and as well as the Bridge Tender Station that we just re restored last year uh, in cooperation with the DNR Canal Commission. And it looks like a brand new building, doesn't it, Tim? It's, it's in good shape. It'll be hopefully be good for another 50 years. That's going to be open. Down in Griggstown, the visitor center in Griggstown, which used to be the Bridge Tenders house, will be open. And that's managed by the Millstone Valley National Scenic Byway. So you'll get to see what a Bridge Tenders house looks like inside, which is furnished. In fact, we furnished one room that looks like a kitchen there. That's going to be open. And the Stats House in Southbound Brook. It's better known as a general's house. General Von Steuben was there during the Revolutionary War. But it's right on the DNR Canal. So if you go there, not only will you get to see what the house looks like, you can walk right down to the canal. I have that, those two things, a calendar, and I thank you very much. Uh, events. Uh, we have had a marvelous year with events. So many different places and places that, that we have been. Um, and we've uh, had a great time doing that. Uh, Tim, want to tell us what's coming up? Thank you. Well, the bad news is there's no events this weekend <laughs> because of the rain. So Waterloo, we're not doing anything tomorrow. And we were planning to do Bootin' Day. Bootin' Day was a big event that we do each year. That's been canceled, too. So uh, t this weekend, you could all stay home. But we've had uh, a great event season. Um, and um, we continue to have a great event season. And it started back in June when we had Byram Canal Day at Waterloo. We woke up. It was pouring rain. Thought it was going to be a disaster. It actually cleared up. And we had more than 600 people there. Uh, and then just past uh, about a month ago, August 19th, Wharton, we had a big Wharton Day event. The weather was perfect. Thousands of people. That was great. And as Joe mentioned, we have been at Waterloo every single Saturday. Our museum's been open. Our boat exhibit's been open. Our grist mill's been open. Uh, Lou, you, there you go, right there. I'm looking, where's Lou? He's right in front of me. Um, does the grist mill. Uh, great numbers we've been having. Um, and we are going to try to continue to operate um, through the end of October. Um, so as Joe said, if we have any new volunteers who would like to help out, um, we'd be appreciated. So uh, I was going to mention a couple other events. Bob already covered one, which is the Somerset County journey through the past. And we talked so much about the Morris Canal, you know, DNR Canal, really cool down there. And he talked about bridge tennis houses. We don't have those in the Morris Canal. Why? We all have the one type of cargo boat. It was low and we had humpback bridges. So they went under it. So we didn't have bridges that open. DNR, you had schooners, you had steamboats, you had tugboats, all kinds of different boats. You had to have the bridges open. So it's a little bit, something a little bit different to go down and see. The other uh, event, which is very similar to this, is Warren County. Warren County's history trail, that's November 4th and 5th. Now, unfortunately, usually Plain 9 West is open. We can go in and see the big turbine. Uh, back in July, the big flood came through. The bridge was destroyed. They have to get it fixed. So Plain 9 West will not be open. But Breadlock Park will be open. And if you've not been to Breadlock Park, a lot of Morris Canal, really cool museum, only working lock model across the state, as far as I know, on the Morris Canal anyway. And the only full-size replica Morris Canal boat. So you ever wonder, wow, what is it like to actually be on one of these Morris Canal boats? We have a replica down there. So we'll have docents there. We'll, um, a lot of cool stuff. Schistler, Morris Canal paintings um, also. So Breadlock Park, um, that's November 4th and 5th. Uh, what else do I have? Oh, October 1st, Sunday, October 1st, a fall festival on the green. Big, big, big event, like 10,000 people. Uh, great event. The Canal Society will be there. Um, and then our last program meeting of the year of 2023 will be November 17th, right before Thanksgiving. So come back for that. So that's all we have on events. Without further ado, we will move to the program. Let me introduce you. You already know who he is, but I'll introduce him anyway. Our president, Joe McKasick, expert, expert on canals, expert on metallurgy, 
Uh, and one thing he didn't mention, he mentioned all these Greenway projects, all the signage that goes up that tells you all about the Greenway. He's the one who produces them. He's a uh, professional graphic illustrator and does a wonderful job with that. So tonight, presentation, mapping the Moyers Canal. Uh, great presentation. Here he is, Joe McKasick. Big air. Well, I'm also why all those projects are late. Okay. Um, Mapping the Morris Canal. This is going to be a journey through um, um, the history of the canal uh, using uh, stuff from our archives. How many people here like maps? Okay. Anybody doesn't have their hand up, they can wait in the back. Because this is going to be lots and lots of maps. Not all of our maps, though. We have lots of maps. Maps tell stories, and we have lots and lots of stories. The more you look at them, the more questions you have, and one of the a couple of the, the first things I'm going to show you are going to be uh, things you probably have never seen before. Okay, this is a map that I found in our collections um, a number of years ago, um, undocumented, unaccessioned, uh, and it is a copy of a map that's attributed to uh, Mr. McCullough. It's signed by him down here, and it's what it's a back of the envelope. Hey, I got an idea of how we could build a canal. Here's here's Great Pond, like a pack on up there in the Highlands. Volume. I'll speak louder. Okay, I'll try to speak louder. You can yell at me when I don't. Lights. Okay, much better. Okay, so uh, this is a drawing attributed to Mr. McCullough. You can imagine him over his favorite watering hole, a couple of beers with his buddies, say, hey, you know, I got a good idea to build a canal. There's this pond way up in the Highlands, great pond. Boy, if I could get a hold of that and make that a canal reservoir, I could build me a canal. And being the Morris County promoter that he was, that, um, he had... Uh, his ideas all centered around Morris County, the iron industry, uh, agriculture, and making his county um, uh, a more industrial and a more prosperous place to live and to do business in. And so he's drawn uh, the outline of uh, of Lake Apacog as it appeared when he first thought of using it as a canal reservoir. You can see it's quite um, quite a bit smaller. Uh, a lot of the coves and inlets and streams moving in are still, well, all of them are still there. It just was dammed and made it much, much bigger. Uh, Brooklyn, where the uh, outlet lock is down here, is now uh, at landing. But you can see how far it used to be away from the bottom of the lake. And then he realized that he, all the rest of this drawing is the Rockaway River. And he realized that that was going to be the route of his canal. And he marked right along it. Um, the things that were important to him, the industrial sites in Morris County, the, the Valley Forge, uh, the Washington's Forge, um, the town of Rockaway and Dover, and um, the things that were going to be important for him building a canal um, across Morris County. The beginning of an idea. Go eastbound only, go westbound. This is just the back of an envelope. This is an idea in somebody's head. Next slide, the idea gets better. It's now um, 1823. That first map is undated. We don't know. I hope it is by him. It's really a great artifact. But by 1823, the idea is beginning to expand. Now, that this is a map that... Uh, is the whole length of the canal. It's very difficult for you folks to read there, but it's all the way from Phillipsburg to um, the uh, um, the Passaic River um, with a suggested route of the canal. And he's got it pretty nice through Warren County. And by, by the time he starts getting near Lake Apacon, there's all sorts of crazy ideas about where he thinks this canal is gonna go. Doesn't make a lot of sense. He's still thinking about how this might work. As a matter of fact, um, Patterson is just sort of on here as an afterthought. 
and it doesn't even quite make it to Newark. Newark is down here, and he's got it. Maybe it'll go to Belleville. Maybe it'll go to Aquaconnect. That must be Passaic. So it's all still being planned out. And of course, this um, um, profile at the bottom is also really, really weird. It really has not been carefully engineered yet. And so this is a work in progress. So the answer, Bill, is that it's a it's a it's growing. It's growing. This is not quite the same map, but it's on the same scale and the same idea. 1827. The route of the canal is now pretty much fixed. He's actually hired a, a, some engineers or what passed for engineers in those days and a surveyor who really knew his business and has really established a route that we would recognize as, you know, there's something I forgot on the last slide because this little inset is really interesting. We know that profile is gonna require some of those inclined planes, those inclined planes we all know and love. Well, here's a drawing that he included just to demonstrate that he had that in hand, that he was going to invent those inclined planes that were going to make this possible. Well, this was a thing in, suggested by uh, Professor Renwick from New York University, who was what passed for a scientist in those days, who passed for an engineer and had supposedly studied this. And this was the idea that he came up with how, how you might be able to build an inclined plane that could lift boats to the proper elevations to accomplish the trip across New Jersey. These are sort of caissons uh, that would travel up and uh, caissons full of water. Boats would be in those caissons and be lifted up and down the plane. It really wouldn't work and it didn't work. So by the time you get here, ideas have improved quite a bit. Um, this map is affectionately called the Forge and Furnace map. If you're interested in iron making and iron mining uh, in Morris County, Mr. McCullough has identified all those places that were important to him. All the forges, furnaces, and important mines right here in the center of Morris County. Um, he's identified um, where they are, and he's identified that many of them are out of business for lack of transportation. So this is a wonderful resource. Um, and of course he has perfected his um, his uh, um, his profile and now he's got his canal going to Newark and he's even suggesting that it will eventually go across Jersey City and end at New York Harbor, something that it would not do until uh, 1836. Okay. Now these are, um, a series of maps, a whole collection of maps that are attributed to Lorenzo Sykes. And he was an assistant engineer and along with uh, um, um, Arnold Mason and Ruben um, Germain, three assistant engineers who were tasked with laying out the, the canal from, um, from, little, from Dover to Little Falls. They were actually out there slogging through the woods, staking out the canal so that um, the contractors could actually get out there with their uh, but their men to start digging that prism. And so um, they were responsible for some of the early designs from those inclined planes and also for mapping the canal as it was conceived while it was still under construction. And so there's a whole collection that was assembled by Bob Goller. So this is all his work. This is a, a volume of uh, a couple of hundred sheets of maps uh, compiled by county. The originals were eventually filed in the county courthouses of, of each county. Um, and they identify the route of the canal as, as it was in, uh, envisioned then. And um, what the approximate locations of the locks and the inclined planes. So it's a huge project. Um, most of you have never seen these. They're rather hard to um, to understand and deal with. Um, how do you figure out where things are in map? You look for landmarks, right? Something you know, and then you could find something you don't know. Well, 
So many things on these maps that you know are not there. They were drawn and they were completed in 1828. Um, the Highlands of New Jersey were not the place that we live in today. Um, in many many uh, situations, it's very difficult to tell what you're looking at when you look at these maps. This is the cover sheet from the Warren County uh, section. And um, page after page of uh, um, uh, accounting for the property that they were taking and what they intended to do um, with that property and each individual municipality as you went along. So this is a huge collection of maps. Here is um, the Booten map. Now, I've um, taken the liberty to add some blue line that represent the canal and identified some of the locations. Here's the Lock 12, Incline Plain, um, 7 East. And so, but, but what's missing on that map? The town of Booten isn't there yet. It's not going to be there for another couple of years. Actually, it's going to be the Booten Ironworks that's going to be there first with enough worker housing to support the people who are going to work there. And eventually, but only eventually, the town grows up around the canal and the water power system that's developed um, to run the ironworks. Um, on each of these maps, there's a, a chart. So we know that land acquired, Mr. William Scott from Powerville, um, they acquired 13.18 acres from him. And from Mr. Peer, an acre, uh, approximately an acre and a half from them. So, um, and each of the um, uh, the people that they're getting land for is identified on the map. And they're all hand-drawn, probably created by, by several different people. It's a huge collection of maps. This is um, Stanhope. William Scott, yes. His brother was the director. Uh-huh. And it was the insider trader Okay. <laughs> that's a whole other story, but that's an interesting story. William Scott, Iron Master from Powerville, was a very influential, uh, uh, well, the whole Scott family were very uh, wealthy and very uh, influential. And uh, William was the Iron Master, and he built his mansion in, in Powerville, a water power site through which the canal was going to, to run. But his brother, was a little more ne'er do well, but he had, was politically connected, and he actually was a director of the canal company. And so, um, you might wonder that you know, since uh, the canal played such an important part in uh, how the canal was going to go to the Booten area, and how that that uh, that that uh, a relationship with what became the Booten Iron Company uh, was going to happen and greatly affect the. Uh, um, the Scott family, you might wonder uh, how much John and 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 William had to do with uh, making sure it happened to their advantage. This is the canal in Stanhope, and again, I pointed out here's Plain Two, and um, um, there's quite a bit of the, Stanhope is already a crossroads community. It was quite a few uh, water power sites, the Muskinekong River winding through here um, is beginning to fall. And so there's lots of opportunity for for, for uh, forges and grist mills and uh, uh, a tannery. Um, but up here, what's missing? Yes, it's not there yet. So that's one of the things that you really have to point. Yes, it's a huge swamp. And so uh, the canal actually has to cross the river up here and it crosses a slack water as it's shown on this map. Uh, it's um, it must have been quite a production building the canal through that mush, but eventually um, the use of the water power um, of the Muskinekong River and the needs of the canal conflicted to the point where they had to do something to to guarantee enough water for everybody's purposes, and that's why they built the Muskinekong Reservoir, as it was called. Now is of course Lake Muskinekong. So, uh, again, one of the things you really have to pour over these maps to be able to understand, and eventually stories come out. Here is um, the Lake of Pakong map. 
and you've got the main line of the canal down here and the feeder canal going up. And here is the the new end of Lake Apakong, um, adjacent to where the Brooklyn Forge had been. And so I think um, that I put on them. Anyway, there's a list here that identifies what property they take. And um, I thought I had made a separate chart, but I didn't. Yes, and it shows that the canal company has already owned the property they needed to build the dam, and then they needed some additional property in order to make the connection with the main line of the canal. So from Mr. Nicholas White, they acquired half an acre, and from um, um, William Keepers, they acquired um, an acre and a half. Not big pieces of property, but required in order to complete um, the engineering of connecting the lake up with the main line of the canal. So did they have this plan before they started or were they doing them simultaneously? This is a memorialization of the plan that was being enacted. And this is what we have. You might imagine what other drawings or notes or material they were using to uh, to stake out. That These guys were already staking out that route so they must have had something else going on and so of course there's no cell phones there's no gps and so they're using the crudest tools that um you, that the romans used to you know uh, uh plot the route of the canal so th this is getting it together so they can submit it uh as a land use record to each county through which the canal is going, you know, how much they're acquiring, what they're going to own, what they paid for it. Um, and they're going to file that in the, uh, as a matter of fact, these maps are still there. They're in the courthouse of, um, of each of the counties through which the canal was gone. And Mr. Sykes is the one who gets the credit, um, probably only because he was involved with the canal more than the other two. When the, the canal was reorganized in the 1840s, um, he was deeply involved in um, organizing that. So he gets the credit for, he gets his name on these maps. He, oh, he was, he was in the 80s. Okay. That's, what, that, that's when this collection of maps was um, handed over to the counties. That's the only question that keeps in my head is at that time, did they know how many hundred feet they were off? Yes. So they could back down the area and figure that out. Yes. They had hired a real surveyor whose name just popped out of my head. So I can There are probably 50 pages of handwritten text to go along with these maps. Anytime you'd like to transcribe those. We have lots and lots of projects like that. I mean, just, you know, answers to questions unasked. So Mr. Sykes or his partners there wrote down everything that they were doing to the satisfaction of the lawyers involved in those days to, to memorialize what they had done. They had acquired all this property. They had they were building a, a public utility. And so um, they created a lot of information. And it will take a lot of work to uncover exactly their words for what they were doing. Um, Skipping along a little further in 1861, this is another effort on the part of the canal company to um, um, memorialize, once again, I'm using that word, uh, on what they had accomplished and how they had done it. This is a cross-section of, that's interesting, there's just a couple of lines on there, um, a cross-section of the Morris Canal in great, great detail. No, I know uh, Bob Goller, who has studied this in great detail, has lots of um, difficulty with some of the figures that they have used about the elevation change and the water flow. But um, this is a, a very, very detailed map laying down uh, lots of information about um, what they're doing in each of the uh, lengths uh, of canal prism, the the, the levels um, is, is is indicated, and every change of elevation is identified, and what that change of elevation is, and so very very detailed map. Right there. 
uh, from Bloomfield on the east to um, Lincoln Park. Mm -mm, getting old. Um, several other long levels, very carefully engineered to go a long ways without having to go up or down. Um, there's a large, there's a full size copy of that in our collection, an original. It's very, very delicate. And so we don't unwrap it very often, but we did have um, some decent uh, paper copies that I had scanned and um, nursed back to life uh, in Photoshop. Photoshop is wonderful. You can really, you can fix something like this. I just happen to know, I just happen to know that it's 59 inches long, 59, so. There's a full-size replica in the museum, in, in our office space, and we just had another one made for Mr. Richter uh, that will go, uh, go back in the museum because we stole his original, because we're so proud of our office. <laughs> we raided our museum for, for lots of goodies. So we made him a new one. Now we just replaced it. So fascinating, uh, fascinating drawing. Okay. Now, the Weir Maps. Weir Maps were created in the 1880s, and they are a series of huge rolls of maps that were um, done by um, Mr. Weir and his engineering staff under the direction of the Lehigh Valley Railroad that they were the leases of the canal at that point. And they were a, a very, very detailed um, set of drawings. Huge. This is map number six from Powerville to Wharton, and it is nine feet long. And it has a, um, um, a map plan view of the canal and also a, um, um, a profile view with very careful measurements. Mr. Goller is going to yell at me because he's got some difficulties with some of the numbers that they use, but they very carefully... Um, uh, Mr. Weir and his engineering team spent a lot of time very carefully looking at the canal, gauging the water flow, um, and um, possibly, possibly with the idea that the Lehigh Valley R Railroad, at the as the, the leasee of the Morris Canal, was realizing that it was not going to be serviceable for much longer. And so they were going to be stuck with it. What else could they do with it? In the 1880s, the late 1880s, the uh, the towns of uh, uh, eastern New Jersey were worried, was beginning to think about water supply. New York had pretty much guaranteed its own water supply with the Croton Aqueduct, huge amount of water coming from the Catskills. Yes, New York. Mm -hmm. And so New York, a huge city that was going to demand a decent water supply if it was going to grow and, and exist. And so what was North Jersey going to do about a water supply? And so, gee, couldn't they do something with the water flow and the Morris Canal that might be to their benefit? So it's suspected that these maps were about thoroughly understanding what they owned, what they leased, what they possessed, and what could they do with it? What was the water flow? What were the actual changes of, of elevation? And how much water could they deliver? And how could they possibly use it? Well, they went to a lot of trouble. And these weir maps became to the, the, the go-to in index for understanding everything about the canal ever since then. So we actually have copies of all these maps, and including a couple of more. The originals are all... Well, not all of the originals, because we do have a couple of originals, but um, they're in the state archives. Let's take a closer look. Come on. So where's the big name? Yes. Uh, I just have my you head can't. Head Did I get that? No, there we go. Um, mm, Silas Ebenezer Weir, chief engineer. By this time, we had engineering school. That he was a real engineer. And again, he's working for the Lehigh Valley Railroad with a whole team of people spending a long time out in the in the in the in the woods, uh, carefully looking at the canal. And uh, there's lots and lots of um, his field books 
not all of them, and 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 of course, his maps have survived because they have be- become the go-to index of what the Lehigh Valley Ra- Railroad was leasing and how all the land records were going to be organized from then on. So um, here is a, a close-up of the canal going through uh, Rockaway, and so identifying Plane Six, and so very detailed um, drawings of the. Uh, um, of, of the canal and the, the, the close by uh, land features. Here's the canal in Booton. Uh, and so here is plane seven and here is rear track 423, 424, 425. And so um, each of those tracks were acquired from somebody and each of them had been messed with at some point. Every time anything had to be done with that particular piece of property, a separate land record was created. And so uh, if you want to know anything about a particular piece of canal, you can look that up. And that view pretty much exists today. Yes. Okay, well, and how might you look that up? Well, you can go to these marvelous volumes that we have in our archives, um, 1,700 records of uh, deeds, agreements, leases, and titles, um, and so 700, <laughs> 1,761 records. These are huge volumes, and so um, every um, thing that happened um, along the canal is recorded there and the deeds and agreements are referenced so that you can go and then find that if you want to know additional information. So here is the abstract um, from, uh, they're all dated from November um, uh, 1821 because they were just about to turn over this huge volume of records that had been uh, in the hands of the Lehigh Valley Railroad to the state of New Jersey because they were abandoning the canal and all that material had to be handed over. And so they created uh, new copies of the Weir maps and they took their individual um, record uh, binders and created these huge volumes, you know, page after page after page of uh, um, all in one place, uh, very neatly printed. Actually, you can see where these pages were eventually in a post binder and they had been bound into three huge books. So, um, and um, so this record of a weird uh, map, um, uh, 425, um, it says that uh, that particular piece of property was acquired from Milton Scott, there's the Scott family again, to the Morris Canal and Banking Company in June 29, uh, 1825. And uh, it is a land contract. So they were, uh, it, it was a gratis gift of land to the canal company. The, the Scots in this particular case realized that having the canals with their property was a benefit far beyond whatever money they could sell the property for. So it was going for a for dollar. Yes. I don't know who you could ask. Okay. It's just. Okay. So page after page, if we move on, for example, to um, uh, 1914, uh, the Lehigh Valley Railroad, Lacey of the Canal, is negotiating with the New Jersey Power Company, and they're getting permission to erect 18 poles um, and two um, anchor, uh, anchors along the towpath um, to lay wires along the canal. And so, uh, and that is going to cost them an annual rent of $43. So there are pages and pages. Some some tracks are all very simple. There's a, a, a simple selling uh, acquisition, price acquisition arrangement. And um, other cases, um, the pages go on and on and on as 
a pipe goes under, a, a, a wire goes over, um, some adjustment is made, somebody wants a basin, you, um, and uh, negotiations are, are required for that. And so um, it can get quite complicated and quite interesting in tr trying to research who actually owns the canal basin adjacent to Lock 2 um, in Wharton. Um, actually, we're not quite sure who owns it. We know when it was bought. We know when it was expanded. We know when it was adjusted and wires went over and pipes went under, but uh, there's no mention of them actually ever selling it or disposing of it. So things can get pretty interesting. They well, County Concrete would like to have it, but they can't. Okay. Um, in 18, 1922, um, again, that transfer of records is going to start to take place. And so um, we've actually got copies of the letters when the, the transfer is being negotiated. So um, this is um, Mr. Van Duzer, and he's the general land agent, Lehigh Valley Railroad. And he is, um, see, I am attaching a list of 14 maps um, and um, the abandonment uh, that, to the, that the abandonment committee has asked for. So this, those 10 maps that I listed before, and plus there are uh, four additional maps of the canal reservoirs, Cranberry Reservoir, Bear Swamp Reservoir, Long Pond, um, and Great Pond. So we got to find those maps someplace. But um, all very interesting. And so then he says over here that um, um, he has his letter of the 17th, and they are going to um, send the copies, and they're going to have they're going to have copies made, and they're going to have them sent over as per requested. And so not only do we have his letter, but we also have his list, and he's listing all of the maps, and um, he's also lifting the price it's going to cost them to have them duplicated. So there's 300 square feet of maps to be duplicated at 13 cents per square foot, and there's going to be it's going to cost $39. Can you imagine? Plus $15 more for another set. So you know somebody's going to have to pay for this. You know, it's going to cost them 54 bucks. And so, you know, <laughs> who was expert on making engineering copies in the 1920s? There was a wet blueprint type process that I don't know the name of, but we have lots of copies that were made that way. And they're they're pretty good. The, the paper, I think that's what it's called, but I'm not any expert on that. Okay. All right. So I got to remember that because it's important because we own a lot of paper with us that has been processed that way. So the paper stands up pretty well. And so um, the maps were copied and the maps were sent. And uh, this is part of a collection of letters that we have. It's uh, a collection of about 200 letters. So I'm telling I'm just pulling out a few letters that actually uh, fit into the story I'm telling tonight. We actually could use a volunteer who want to read the rest of those 200 letters because there's got to be more stories in there. Lots of interesting stories. <laughs> well, if somebody else wants to complain, they can call you. Okay. Just a little uh, diversion from maps for a minute. This is payday on the Morris Canal. Um, this is a payroll record um, to the commissioners in 1842. And so it lists the payroll and um, the um, superintendent is making, this is yearly figures now, uh, $2,400. Big money in those days in 1842. Um, the, super, uh, the supervisors uh, along the, the route of the canal are being paid at seventy-five to sixty-five dollars a month, making six hundred to two hundred or five hundred and twenty dollars a year. Makes you think, doesn't it? Um, the smaller guys, the plane tenders, um, average plane tender is making um, forty-two dollars a month. Lock tenders are um, 
but making $18 um, um, a month. And um, the total um, payroll is coming to $1,372. They got a house with that. They got a house with that. Makes all the difference, I guess. Now, if we jump ahead, this is a um, um, an accounting, a monthly accounting from 1868. And so it lists um, the lock and plane tenders, and they're all signing off that they've gotten paid. And so, uh, and we complain about, you know, everybody's on strike these days because they're not making enough money and the world is not fair. But in all that time, nobody had gotten much of a raise because plane tenders are still making $41. Uh, brakemen are making $38 a month. Um, assistant lock tenders, $27. And so... Um, Lock tender. Well, if you want to attend, if you want to tend two locks, you want to be you're really, really ambitious, you can make $64 a month. And so um, next time you're complaining about what you're making, you can start working for the canal company. So the lock tender making pair of two locks would be like Mr. Pier in Denver. A good example of lock three and lock four at Dover just along Princeton Avenue, just west of Dover. You've got two locks within a couple of hundred feet of each other. And so um, that lock tender probably hired uh, an assistant, but ran both locks, paid his assistant, and made a couple of extra bucks. His house is right in between the two locks. Uh, lots of other kinds of things in our collection. We have all kinds of atlases, People have donated over the years. This is an atlas of the city of Newark. And just to help understand the, you know, where, where are you looking at? I put some white lines. And so this is right in the center of, of Newark. This is from the bottom of uh, Inclined Plane 15, I believe. And so this is the Newark um, Center Market. And so it was actually built over the top of the canal. And this is the canal reaching down to its junction with um, the... Um, uh, the Passaic River, or the the uh, old the, the the channel that left off into the Passaic River, that was the original terminus of the canal, and then the extension to Jersey City is heading off this way. So, very nice atlas in very good condition, with a lot of lots of details. Nineteen oh one. More recently, here is an atlas Bluefield and Belleville, and Nutley, and here is the route of the canal as it has been abandoned. And it's not shown in detail, but the route is still extant. It still exists. And again, very, very nice atlas. We've got several of these atlases from different periods of time. And so um, lots of different kinds of small collections of maps. Um, we have a couple of folders of these, um, what I'm calling work order maps. Every time something had to be done along the canal, some... Um, Contractors had to be hired or um, some utility needed to be to cross over or under the canal or a bridge needed to be fixed. Um, these maps were generated. And this is a map of um, a tract of land near uh, in Newark, adjacent to Lock uh, 19 East. And you know, here's the lock and a uh, piece of property that's under dispute being claimed by uh, the, the Dyke estate has been um, identified. And so, and, and over here is the Blanchard Street Bridge. And here is another map from that same collection identifying the Blanchard Street Bridge and uh, a wire crossing situation that had to be approved by the canal company. So uh, map after map, project after project, sometimes these maps show very interesting details that don't show up any place else. Okay, these are uh, abandonment drawings, and there are hundreds of these. We have a, a good collection. There's still lots, lots more of these to, to get. 
But uh, the most fascinating ones, the ones that people most like, are the ones of the inclined planes. So um, Mr. Cornelius Vermeule was the um, consulting and directing engineer who um, organized the abandonment, the engineered the abandonment of the Mars Canal. And so um, he was in charge of uh, having all this work done. And so for um, every um, piece of canal to be dismantled or altered or removed, um, a drawing was made. And so the ones of the inclined planes are probably the most interesting ones. And so here is uh, the drawing uh, 215 of plane six, which is um, Port Colden, right? Tim says yes. And so here is the, the whole plane in, in very uh, large detail showing you know every aspect of the plane and what work is to be done, what's to be removed, what's to be filled in. Um, um, and so um, this is um, including things that you wouldn't think would be important. But Mr. Vermeule was that's just that kind of a guy. He just insisted they have details, details on everything. And uh, which comes through in his his um, his, uh, his drawings of the Bhutan plane that we are on the table in the archives. See them after, and this is a, a much larger map. And these are um, uh, bridge locations from Bloomfield to Clifton. So this is the whole line of the canal from Bloomfield down here to Clifton, identifying bridges and culvert crossings, all that need to be removed as part of the, the abandonment. And this is being, you know, carefully funded and needs to be carefully accounted for all the work that needs to be done. Okay, also, lots and lots of abandonment stuff. Lots of paper that has survived comes from this period of time. And this is uh, a collection of photos uh, created by John A. Waters, who calls, you know, identified himself as a. Uh, an old building specialist, and he was sent out to photograph um, the buildings that were owned by the canal company. What were they going to do with these buildings? Well, they haven't worked to fill to, to, to fix them up in years and years and years. And uh, he was sent out to make an accounting of what kind of condition were they in, and well, what were they going to do with those buildings? And um, the guy was a terrible photographer. They sent him out with a camera. I mean, he was supposedly a photographer, but he sort of aimed the camera in the direction of the building and clicked the shutter. And sometimes they were crooked and sometimes they were they were just a mess. And so, but the record that he created is really interesting. And so um, here is, um, this is uh, in Green Township and this is at Plain 9 and this is the lock tender's house. And it's, uh, the rent is ten dollars a month. Can you imagine that for for a beat up old house? And so um, the record goes on and on, identifying uh, building after building. Here is one in um, pretty good detail, and the picture is actually fairly straight. Um, I think that's the Brakeman's house, one but it's yeah. <laughs> It's on on the property of Plain Nine West, but there are several buildings that they own, obviously, because it tells you that um, um, Kate Leffler uh, is the current occupant, and she's being charged six dollars a month. Outrageous, and so it's a frame dwelling in poor condition. So what are they going to do? And Mr. Stewart, Mr. Stewart uh, Sherman has offered $400 for this house and also house uh, double house 10 and 11. Probably Lee's house. Yes. And so there are several structures. And so it's an interesting record of some structures, canal structures that are just not um, photographed, not not um, uh, images that have just not survived in any other way. So there's a large collection of copies, again by Bob Goller, of um, um, of the binder that the, 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 uh, contained all this connection. And we've got well, make an offer, so offer offer four fifty. Thank <laughs> you. 
picky, 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 you know? <laughs> picky, picky, picky. Yes, no indoor plumbing either. That wasn't going to come for a while. So um, in many cases, these buildings have not been, you know, attended to in a long, long time. But still, they needed to be um, disposed of and gotten rid of. That they had to come off the off the rolls. The, the the state of New Jersey didn't want them. All this land needed to be sold, or um, um, or given away, given back to the original owners of the heirs of the original owners, according to the uh, the terms of the abandonment. So this was all work that had to be done, and so um, these pictures survive from that accounting. So. Um, our collections include all kinds of things. Now, this is right up to the current day. This is 19, uh, uh, 2001, and this is a collection of drawings that um, um, we got because we were involved in um, the historic aspects of um, the, exp the um, um, improvements of Waterloo Road. Waterloo Road goes, Waterloo Road and the canal going south from Waterloo Village um, pretty much go hand in hand. And in lots of cases, the canal and the and the road merge. So when that road was, was widened, uh, we were involved as consultants in making sure that as little, you know, interference with the historic right away of the canal uh, was done as possible. Now here's a, a section that is marked historic site, Mars Canal, no disturbance allowed. And so, um, we get involved in these kinds of things, and so, and well, well, we should, and so we have many collections of these kinds of drawings that show um, how changes were made and why changes were made. Let's see what else we have, and we got new maps. We make new maps all the time. This is just one of the walking tour maps that are on the website, by the way, and this is one of Jersey City. Not a place that many of us visit, but it makes a very interesting walk. And here is the, the Colgate clock, Bob. I, I, you're still there. You, you don't have to wind it up anymore, though, do you? No. Okay. They rebuilt it. Anyway. These maps don't, don't look like this. Yes. I keep referring to them as the Joe McKasick maps. Oh, dear. Is that, is that accurate? <laughs> no, just me. <laughs> If you can have me, if you if you're in charge of cloning, we need to talk. Yes, I do. Yes, there are so many projects, so many good projects, and I love doing these things. Running the Canal Society is a big, big job, and so there's always the balancing between one and another. And there are also those other great projects. Reading those letters memorializing the text from these these uh, uh, skikes uh, um, uh, maps. Um, there are many things that other people could do and would have a great deal of fun doing. Um, I'm sure John has a whole long list of archival projects that just need delving into. There are stories there. They need to be found. They need to be drawn out. And so... Um, Somebody needs to do them. And that leads me to the last image. Oh, well, speaking of the devil, how do we use this, all this information, all this stuff in the archives? This is what we use to create um, these uh, um, interpretive panels that we're always talking about. The sign projects that I mentioned earlier at the introduction, um, they all use the materials from, from the archive. Every time I do one of these projects, I'm delving into history, and I need to have facts. I need to know exactly how to talk about it, what we're telling people that we're doing. And so this is the, the Newark panels that we just finished. They're going to go um, at Lock and New Street. There's a piece of public property there across from the college, and so uh, a three-panel set. And so they've just been... Um, uh, that's been finished and sent off to be be approved. So hopefully we'll be able to get those fabricated shortly. And so, and this is the Dover panel. This is the one that's going to be in Waterworks Park. And this is really, 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 really a great picture. This is from the hill overlooking Princeton Avenue. 
And here is the canal. And remember I told you about, you asked, Bill, Pierce, you asked about uh, double lock tenders. Well, here is lock four. And there in the trees is lock three. And so the lock tender is running back and forth, back and forth. Well, him and his assistant. Absolutely. They're in the uh, the Booten, Booten Iron Company site. I don't think it's the Booten Steel Company yet. No, it wouldn't be, not yet. But the canal is going to wind around, go up an inclined plane, and then come right alongside um, the, the, uh, um, the, the Iron Company's property. And so, and here's Princeton Avenue. And if you go there today, those houses are still there and a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, I think that's the last one. Look, here's here's what the archives used to look like, not that long ago. Packed solid. Try to squeeze an envelope in there, and so now, of course, it looks like this. Lots of room, um, and many uh, collections have been added since. But now we have room to work, and John has it very, very, very well organized and getting better all the time. Thanks, this gentleman here, Mr. Wefferling, um, and a lot of other interesting pieces of furniture from, from um, Jeff and Lou. And um, we even have some stuff that Bob gave us years ago. Some of that stuff has been replaced, but um, we have a lot of very good and safe um, containers to put all our, our stuff in. And so that is basically the end of the presentation, except to continue on with what John told us earlier. We're looking to be able to uh, invite folks to come and use our archives soon. By the end of the year, we hope to be able to, uh, for uh, you folks to make an appointment, to come with some ideas and investigate some of the things that we've you've seen tonight. This is only the tip of the iceberg. We have so many interesting things. And so, uh, but they're no good unless people use them. So the, one of the objectives is to make them usable. And by the end of the year, we hope to be able to make that work for you. Absolutely. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and you expect me to tell you the combination. No way. <laughs> Just swinging that door open every morning is just a thoughts or questions, folks. So the um, the microfiche collection yes comes from I guess the state records. There's a microfiche collection. That yes, they they do have is stuff that there. Is redundant to what you guys collected or mingled, or is that an entirely different set of stuff? They have originals of a lot of material. We have originals of a bunch of material. We're working with them to copy a lot of the material they have and make it more available. Um, and so um, I don't particularly, I have never explored the microfiche collection. Um, well, the gentleman said microfiche. This also, yes, no, 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 no. They are, they, they are different things. Oh, well, okay. That is microfilm. Okay. Well, then we're talking about a whole different thing. <laughs> we have 121 rolls of microfilm with a huge amount of information. This was a project quite a number of years ago when we partnered with the archives to um, create um, um, a, 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 to to microfilm many, 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 many documents. And so, um, um, this is material that the um, uh, the archives has the originals of in the state archives. In some cases, we now have copies of, you saw those letters that list the interchange between uh, Van Duzer and the uh, um, Lehigh Valley Railroad and the, uh, and, and, and the, uh, and the state. And so um, we own our originals of that. Um, we've got, we cannot own copies of the Weir maps because they own the originals, but we've got, um, first, first person, you know, uh, copies. And now we've got electronic scans of those compliments of, of Jim Lee. 
He'll be talking about a lot of that next time in November. They're working, um, Hunter Research, his company, and uh, and Margaret Hickey's company are working on a Morris Canal uh, National and, and Local Register of Historic Places expansion project. And as part of that, they are working on identifying a whole bunch of material from the archives. Other questions, sir? Good question. Good question. Um, the earliest dates in that those huge tomes of books are in um, or in the 18, 1824. And so uh, the canal was actually chartered in 1825. So you might think that before they were chartered, some land was being acquired, but you're you're getting really, really nitpicky here. And so, <laughs> again, all those stories are in the are, are buried in those in that information. D sometimes deeply buried, but um, uh, going through these books uh, is fascinating, tedious, uh, mysterious. Sometimes it leads to more questions than answers. So, um, I'm pretty sure that they they were they were looking to build a transportation system, a public utility, privately owned, because the state of New Jersey declined to to finance it. But um, you saw Mr. Sykes was memorializing their their acquisitions of property and reporting that to the counties through which they was passing. So I don't think there was any skullduggery done there. And the property passed in a number of different ways as those documents. Sometimes it was given, sometimes it was taken under condemnation, sometimes it was deeds, um, different different ways, and you can you can you can look all that up. Other thoughts or questions? Mr. Richter first. Sir. Yes, very early during uh um Hagamon yes. publishing the Catholic Liar. But there was actually a gate in further south that was the lock. And it's a five inches. Actually, he doesn't show any such thing. He just shows the lake and and and, and sort of where it ends in a swamp. And then way down here is where the lock actually was. Okay. Was this the original first slide or the or Wait. okay, yes. So um the Sykes map shows it pretty much like it exists in the pictures today. And in the um, um, the weir maps, and so yes, there there was a four bay with an outer gate, and then the um, um, the guard lock, and then the canal so feeder. Yes. I Bill. just wanted to ask Joe. I know uh, several years ago, Linda was working in state archives with uh, microfilm projects. Uh, Canal Society has a DMR, a copy of the DMR microfilm. We have we have some microfilms. In, um, uh, in your collections between Morris Canal and DMR Canal, vastly more Morris Canal stuff. Uh, most of the DNR Canal nitty gritty records wound up in the possession of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Sort of in a warehouse in Trenton, which burned. Yes. And so things still pop up all the time. Things that you've collected, lots of them things that you've given to us, and we treasure those too, but we don't have that that huge collection of, of material. And then stuff pops Morris Canal stuff pops up all the time. We just we, we bought a, a, a huge collection of, of, of letters and and, and 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 books just recently. And um are always looking for more. Those those three tomes um, I bought on eBay just a couple of months ago. They just popped up and I gobbled them up and they're just packed with information. Bob, did I see a question? Pierce first. Since there, 
information that you believe has been in the Morris Canal and Banking Company's office in Jersey City? Um, I think you're thinking the Jersey, the the Mars Canal, and uh, the 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 um, uh, it's a it's, it's the one in in Phillipsburg. We bought a collection of material several years ago that involved letters that talked about what are we going to do with the the um, um, it's not the lock tender's house, it's the collector's house, <laughs> the collector's building. In Phillipsburg, you know, we don't need it anymore. We need to get rid of it. Letters back and forth, back and forth. Wonderful story. Um, oh, well, it's it's packed with records. What do we do? Does anybody want them? Back and forth. It's finally decided. Well, I'm not going to tell you how it's decided because that's another story. <laughs> Come back next time and I'll finish that story for you. <laughs> All right. Any more thoughts or questions? Mm -hmm. Online comments. Other story. Yes, online comments. So uh, there are a couple of people offering from California or Kentucky to uh, read some of the documents if we put them online. Are there plans to scan some of these documents that mm. you transcribe? Okay. Um, that would have to be accomplished. Um, yes, if, if we have um, uh, people uh, at a distance who would like to work with us, um, yeah, we, we, can, we can scan and, and, and share um, collections with people who would like to get involved. With the question, whether the illustration of the canal in Newark would be published as a pamphlet, um, there's no plan, no plan so far. We have an agreement with, uh, with Newark to create, uh, this sign project and a place to put it. We envision this as the start. We'd like to have several other projects at important places in, in Newark, but, uh, this particular, those, those are not really intended to be a brochure. Um, if we find, uh, a meaningful way to do that. We own that material and could accomplish that. You have the walking tour guides on the website. Mm -hmm. uh, and the last question was, does the society have a microfilm reader? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, yes. It, we, we have, it's a monster and it's ancient. It might be... <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be be silly, but it might be steam powered. But it's, yeah, I'm sure that does have a plug. Um, <laughs> the um, the newest generation of microfilm readers are marvelous. The, um, the uh, Mars County Library has got uh, three of them, and so when I want to look at our microfilm, I go to their library. And so um, the new ones um, are actually hooked up to computers and they're much faster, much brighter. You can change the orientation. You can brighten them and dim them. You can uh, actually uh, make digital copies or print copies as you go through. And so um, they're worth about $6,000 a piece, but Oh, no, no, yeah, that's me, 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 push the button, yes, so. Um, you go like this while you're using it. Yes, it, just, it, just it to get some. Nostalgic. So, yes, we own uh, 121 rolls of microfilm, and so uh, we have an index of what's on them. I've never gone through them all. Bob, have you gone through micro the microfilm? Okay. Probably the 80s or 90s. And I think there's four copies. Um, we we went 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 through the archives. Why don't you come over here, Bob? So the Jersey Archives County Library. We'll let Bob tell us because I don't know that story. We're talking about the Canal Society's microfilm film com, uh, collection. It was uh, copied back, I think, in the 80s or early 90s, working with the state archives. Um, all 120 rolls, most of it was transfer deeds and when the canal was sold and i think that accomplishes maybe 80 or 90 rolls i think there's only one roll of maps is that right 
three rolls of maps. And two, well, maybe missing from our collection, but there are other collections. Uh, and so most of it is is not very interesting unless you're doing a book on the history of the selling of the Morris Canal. Uh, the, where they went, one went to Alexander Library, I'm pretty sure. One went to the Morris County Library System. One went to the National Canal Museum. I think one went to Princeton. I'm not really sure. And then the Canal Society of New Jersey has a collection. I used our microfilm reader back in the 80s, 90s, and back in the 90s. And I went through mainly the later ones, the map ones and things. And they're quite detailed. They're quite interesting, cranking, cranking it along. You, you can learn a lot. So we did that as a public service, making the three copies and passing them around. Don't know what the other the condition of the other uh, ones are you may find those two missing rule roles i do know with the canal societies some of the roles were were borrowed at one time and they may not have come back whereas if you go to alexander library or if you go to the national canal museum you may find those missing roles if you know what you're looking for yeah, rutgers 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 and princeton national canal museum of course and the state archives of course has a copy well <clears throat> Yes, but anyway, you were park. Um, okay, for starters, the, the county library does not have all 121 reels. They've only got like 72 reels. And I had a good argument with the, the director about that, but he... Remember back in the way, he wanted two more rolls of Okay. And I've got an index of the roles that we have, that we physically have, and and the ones that are missing. So I don't know. Um, I think Bob Goller has a few, and some are Lord knows. So other thoughts or questions? I just wanted to uh, thank Joe. I've been bugging him for quite some time about duplicating the paintings that are on the wall. I think there's a total of seven of them, six, and Joe has done it. Thank you very much. The originals are in the archives, copies on the wall here and copies on the wall in um, Waterloo. And they are for sale if people would like to have a copy taken home and frame it. A uh, final announcement is that tomorrow is supposed to be the second annual Railroad Festival at Phillipsburg, and they have wisely postponed it until next Saturday. Thank you. Okay. Bowden is also canceled because of weather. <clears throat> Uh, we haven't heard that. Okay, but that's a separate discussion. Okay. Thank you all. Um, next meeting is November, and I think it's the 18th, but the, 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 you'll, be, you'll be notified. Now, I need to thank Bobby for the salads. Yes. And arranging all the food. <laughs> And we had to thank Tam for transporting the sandwiches anyway. I'm going to open up the office. We've got t-shirts for sale. Everybody needs to have a t-shirt. Calendars. Calendars. Okay. And so. Uh, okay. Thank you again for coming. Hope you enjoyed.